but welcome and we appreciate again uh, you all joining us here. Again, Experience AI Solution is very happy to have you here with us today. We appreciate your time, your effort. I know you might be busy. As Kim said, the weather is so nice. You want Maybe you wanted to go out, but you're stuck here with us for one hour. So <laughs> welcome. Um, my name is Joshua, and I am into the recruitment industry for over nine years, and I'm working with experience for almost two years. I'm specialized in IT recruitment. I'm a colleague of Kim. And today, as promised, we will be discussing about the webinar entitled navigating the job market. So just a couple of reminders before we start. Uh, during the webinar, you can interact with me or with Kim through the Q&A section if you have any questions or you have chat uh, feature as well. You feel free to chat because we will be asking some interactive questions. Uh, you can participate on that. If you have any questions or concerns, again, please feel free to ask us. So without any delay, let's uh, welcome our host for this afternoon, Kim, and she'll be talking about navigating the job market. Hey everyone. So like Josh said, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Kim Beardsell. I'm the Director of Talent Acquisition at Experience. I've been in the IT recruitment industry for over 12 years, and I've been working with Experience for a little over four years. So we're going to dive right in. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Just give me one second. Josh, I'm unable to share my screen. It says that I'm a participant and not a host. I'm sorry, guys, for this trouble. We've never had that problem before. That's, uh, that's strange. How about now? There we go. Perfect. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna bring up my chat as well so that I can see what all you lovely people are saying. Wonderful. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about navigating the job market. Now, obviously some things have changed because of COVID-19 and this can impact the way that you're looking for a job and what you can do to make yourself more accessible and more noticeable to hiring managers and recruiters. So we'll be looking at various places you can look for jobs online and we'll talk about your online presence, what you can do to improve it. And then we're gonna talk in detail about what the importance of your LinkedIn profile and what you can do to make it as strong as possible. So the COVID-19 pandemic has quickly changed the lives of Canadians. Both federal and provincial governments have implemented measures that we all are familiar with now. They encourage us to stay home. They're continuing to encourage social distancing which unfortunately has led to many businesses closing their doors and millions of Canadians losing their jobs. Though the economy has been hit hard by these changes, we're slowly starting to reopen and there are some bright spots. Certain sectors in the IT industry have actually had a surge in hiring. So during the pandemic, Canadians have been spending a lot of time indoors and on the internet, both for work or for personal reasons. So things like social media, mobile apps, video conferencing, websites, e-commerce, any other kind of digital channel, they've been ex experiencing extremely high volumes as people turn to these sources to buy things and to connect with other people. So to operate smoothly, online tools and platforms require the skills and expertise of developers and other IT professionals. Many businesses are ramping up their development, development teams in order to increase the capacity for their e-commerce systems, but also to troubleshoot issues that they've never had to face before. Having functional user-friendly digital channels, <clears throat> excuse me, is especially critical right now. They're offering retailers and other businesses a much needed source of revenue that they haven't had for a few months. And there's other IT specialties that have also been in high demand due to the increase in people working from home. So things like data security professionals and networking help desk, they've all been working around the clock. Now, while previous jobs were gener generally found on job boards like Monster, Workopolis, Indeed, times have changed and those aren't the hot spots anymore. Right now, there's three key places that people are using to source jobs. That's Google, LinkedIn 
and then a company's direct career job board on their website. A recent search that Josh did of LinkedIn and Google showed us that there was literally thousands of job postings in Montreal specifically for IT jobs, ranging from really, you know, first level all the way up to very senior positions. There was almost 4,000 IT related jobs in Montreal listed just on LinkedIn. So these are both excellent places to search on top of the usual job sites you're probably already using, but some of them in a bit more detail. So some that are more local to Quebec include Job Boom and Jobilico. Across the rest of the country, there's Career Builder, Zip Recruiter, Job Rapido, and then a bunch of others that you're seeing on your screen. A great site to be aware of is Glassdoor. So this site has thousands of job listings, but also company reviews from existing previous employees, CEO approval ratings, they do salary reports, interview reviews, Sometimes there's even benefits or even uh, pictures of the office. But you might have also heard about both provincial and federal job sites that were created since the beginning of COVID-19. And they're free for employers to post and they focus on really current jobs that are open both for the provincial one across Quebec and then the federal across Canada. That being said, I mean, go, go and do your own research, but we've done some for this webinar. And we discovered that on both of these sites, there really were very few IT positions listed. They really focus much more on the service, manufacturing and healthcare industries. So I'm curious with you guys, you can tell us in the chat, where's your favorite site? Share with everybody so that everybody can learn. What are your favorite sites to search for jobs? I'm on it, Kim, on the chat section, just to so yes. let you know. <laughs> no issues. So I received one comment, uh, LinkedIn. Absolutely. One of their favorite ones. Yeah. Indeed, uh, job board. Yeah, I can see going directly to the employer's webpage. Yeah. Absolutely. Zip recruiters, Glassdoor, these are very yeah. good. Uh, Those are all really the very popular ones. And just so you guys know, with recruiters, okay, I didn't know that one. And Indeed, you've had good experience with recruiters and Indeed, well, that's good. And just so you guys know, after the webinar, we're gonna be sending you a couple of documents and one of which is a list of many of the websites that were either mentioned that you see on the screen and then some others as well. There's a good list of about, I'd say about 20 websites that you can search for jobs in Quebec or across Canada. Seeing somebody else is mentioning Workopolis. Glassdoor for salaries, absolutely. I would also like to mention Job Ilico. For sure, very local here to Quebec, absolutely, if you're in this province. All right. So as I mentioned briefly before, you'll also want to search through websites of various companies, so like we were talking about directly on the employer's page. So take the time to look through the sites of companies that are located in your city, but these days you can also branch out to other cities since many companies are now much more open than they were before to considering remote employees in the long term. You want to target companies that are in a sector of interest to you or who are in sectors that you already have experience with. You can also target companies that work with specific technologies that you're specialized in. Or, and don't be afraid to do this, you can just send your CV spontaneously. Most companies will have a section on their website where you can just apply to the company without specifically applying to a particular job. And this is a really great way to get your CV in front of their talent acquisition department. Beyond looking at job sites, one of the most effective ways to find a new job is through networking. 35% of surveyed professionals say that a casual conversation on LinkedIn messaging has led to a new opportunity. So those are some really huge numbers. Career networking can involve using personal, professional, academic, or even family contacts to assist in both your job search and your job, your career progression. So, you, and you can also, sorry, it can also help you learn about fields that you might be interested in working in, but you would never have, or you don't have experience in them yet. So this can be done in many different ways. You can connect with past colleagues and managers. You can create new connections on various social media platforms. And you can reach, up, reach out 
and connect with people through online meetup. So like through a site like meetup.com. Another way of networking might be to create your own blog or your podcast, if that's something that you'd be interested in doing. Or it can be as simple as making connections with past coworkers to see how they're doing, and then you can let them know at the same time that you're looking for new opportunities. Reaching out to people who know the quality of your work, who respect you as both a colleague and a friend, these are connections that might help you to find that new opportunity you're looking for. You might want to consider doing virtual meetup groups like meetup.com and other sites that are like that just to discuss topics that are passionate for you, whether it's software development or something completely unrelated, fishing, hunting, whatever it is that you like doing. You just never know who you're going to meet. And the more connections you have right now, the better positioned you will be for future job opportunities. Something to never forget is that looking for a full time job is its own full time job. There's no connection, no effort that's too small because you just never know where it might lead. Of utmost, of utmost importance during this time is knowing what your online presence says about you. So according to a survey done by CareerBuilder, at least 40% of employers are less likely to interview applicants they cannot find online. So you really want to take the time to Google yourself, see what comes up. Look through your Facebook profile, your personal website if you have one, a GitHub account, or just any other social media site with your name on it. You want to ensure that the pictures you've used represent you in a positive light and that you don't have any comments or articles you've shared that could be seen negatively. A recent study showed that the five most common warning signs that are flagged by recruiters and hiring managers when they're doing a social media check is discriminatory comments made related to race, religion, sexual orientation, gender, anything like that, any discriminatory comments, negative comments about a previous employer or colleague, inappropriate photos or videos, anything related to drug use, and lastly, using a professional platform like LinkedIn for personal posts. So as a job seeker, you should really assume that companies are using any details about you that they can find online in order to determine their interest in your candidacy. Everything that can be found out about you becomes an extension of your CV and of your application. A good thing to keep in mind when you're spending time online and particularly on social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook is to post as if the whole world is watching. Post as if your future employer is about to read what you're going to say. Along the same lines, you want to ensure that you're representing yourself online as an expert in your field, as a kind and compassionate person, and as a thoughtful and proactive colleague and employee. Comments posted on sites that are easily searchable are going to affect how people see you and how they perceive your level of knowledge, as well as what kind of person they think you are. So the more helpful, knowledgeable, and accurately you can represent yourself and your skills, the more likely you are to be seen positively by hiring managers and HR professionals that are Googling you before your interview. You want to view your online presence as your personal brand. Aim to establish yourself as an individual who cares about particular topics and ideas, which can also open doors to making online connections that could potentially lead to employment opportunities. If you're in the IT industry, as most of you are, there's many sites that you can contribute to online, like Stack Overflow or Reddit, GitHub, Stack Exchange. There's tons of different sites and there's other coding forums that you can join depending on your specialty. You wanna be sure that you're not just joining them, but you're actively contributing to the site. You're engaging in posts, you're answering questions, you're positioning yourself as an expert. Gone are the days when your CV was the only thing that people saw before they met you in person. We're in a world where learning everything about what you've done in the last 10 years is just a click away. So you wanna be aware of really, really careful about what kind of presence you have online and what impression you might be making on those who would be interested in working for you. Something to keep in mind is that more and more companies are now requesting social media checks as part of their, part of their background verifications prior to hiring candidates. So is there anything, I'd be curious to know from you guys, is there anything that you've done to improve your online presence already? Or is all this just new to you that 
you've never heard that you need to do this before. Kim, somebody commented uh, they have participated in GitHub chats. Fantastic. You have LinkedIn. Yeah, I see somebody's doing some LinkedIn activity every morning, which is great. Keeps your profile really current and that you're showing up. We'll talk more specifically about LinkedIn in just a couple seconds. Updating the CV on job boards. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of, uh, so the Workopolis and Indeed, if your CV is really old and it's been up there for a long time, you might not be showing up in searches that recruiters and HR people are doing because there's filters that we can use that show us who's updated their CV in the last seven days or in the last month. Excuse me. So that's really important to keep it updated regularly. Oh, good. I see that somebody is saying that they're making an online personal blog. You always wanted to do that when you were employed, but now that you're unemployed, you can work on some project content. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, of course, it's hard to find time to do that when you're working. Oh, what a great project to be doing right now. And just to improve the online presence, somebody said that uh, deleting the pic old pictures, which are not professional. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You want to you want to get rid of those pictures of yourself in college having a keg party with your friends. Probably not appropriate anymore. <laughs> um, see, I see that somebody's saying they added a Twitter account, but they're not tweeting. They're just following. I would say as much as you can try to reply to things, comment on things, retweet things, because it's good that you're just following, but you're not going to show up in any kind of search if somebody's looking for you on Twitter. They, they, something that's, that's great to do is to, is to post things so that people can see what you're interested in. Absolutely. Another thing somebody's saying is making their personal social media accounts private. And that way they're not, they're not coming up in searches just regularly. Those are all great points. So we're going to switch our focus a bit now. We're going to talk about, uh, specifically talk about LinkedIn. So to understand the importance of having a thorough and clear LinkedIn profile, I think the first step is that it might help if you understand how recruiters and HR professionals are using LinkedIn to find you. So the most commonly used method to find candidates on LinkedIn is going to be an advanced search in which recruiters can enter a whole set of variables and then find candidates that fit those variables. So those can be keywords from a job description like technologies that somebody's looking for. It can be a location, years of experience, years on the job market, language skills. And then there's also different filters that we're gonna talk about too. We can filter through candidates who are more likely to respond and candidates who are open to new opportunities. So in this example, I created a search for a Java developer based in Washington. And then I added Spring and Hibernate, which is what we see that's popping up. Now, as you can see, there's way too many results. There's 4,500 results. So I'm going to narrow down my search by scrolling down. And then I'm going to select here candidates who have indicated that they're open to contracts. So there's still too many results really to handle as a recruiter. So in one day, so I'm going to then use like 806. It's a little much. So I'm going to use these filters here that I had mentioned before, more likely to respond and open to work. These are going to help me narrow my focus and get more traction in the emails I'm going to be sending these people. Now, in order to show up in these two filters, this is what you need to do. For the first filter, more likely to respond. This is based on candidate relationships with the recruiter and their affinity with our company and anyone working for it. So connecting yourself to numerous recruiters on LinkedIn, following company pages, this is going to help your profile fall under this filter. Also, your previous response rate to in-mails will factor into this algorithm. So even if you're not interested in a job, it's a really good idea to respond to the in-mail just to let them know you're not interested, just so that you, you stay active and you're going to show up in this filter that you're more likely to respond. The open to work filter. Wow. 
You must choose to show recruiters that you're open to new opportunities. It's not going to happen automatically. And then you have the choice to make this visible only to people who have a recruiter seat in LinkedIn or to the general LinkedIn community. And we're going to take a look together at where you can go in your profile to make this change. So first we go into our profile. Now this is just the top part of somebody's profile, but you can see here if you go into yours, there's a section here that show recruiters you're open to work. Then by clicking on this link, a screen is going to come up and give you multiple options. You can add job titles that are of interest to you. You can add your location or any location that might be interested, you might be interested in if you're willing to relocate. You can also indicate if you're looking for an immediate start or if you're flexible about that. And at the bottom, you're going to select all the different types of job opportunities you're open to. When I filtered earlier based on individuals who were open to contracts, this is where the system would have found this information. The approximately 4,000 people who were removed from my search string had not selected contract. Now, I'm sure that some of them would potentially be open to contract, but by using that filter, I'm ensuring that I'm not wasting my time and I'm only contacting people who have expressly indicated an interest in contract work. So you can select as many of these options as you want. And the last section is to choose who sees that, you, what, uh, that you're open to opportunities. So then when we click here to open this section, you can choose to either share with everyone on LinkedIn or only with recruiters. If you choose the first option, the banner, there's a banner that'll be placed around your picture, indicating that you're open to networking. As you can see, there are countless ways that people can search for suitable candidates. The most important thing to remember is that people need to be able to find you. The more information you include, and the more detailed you are in your profile, <clears throat> excuse me, the more likely you are to appear in a search. Your profile should be an extension of your CV, but it should also include recommendations from past colleagues and managers, personal interests you have, professional groups you're a part of, as well as a list of companies and people that you follow. This is a way to highlight not only your experiences, but really your passions and what you're interested in. You also, and this sounds silly, but you want to be sure to associate your LinkedIn account to an email that you check regularly so that you can be sure that you don't miss an important email for a new position. I'm sure Josh has had it before and I've had it many times before that I'll get a response months after sending out an email and the person was actually interested, but they just didn't see my message in time. Before we move on, we're really going to look at two profiles in detail. Are there any questions up to this point? Um, I'm looking at yeah, we'll let take, we'll give people some time to write in their questions. Yeah. So it's about LinkedIn searches. If you are up to it, Kim. Yeah, yeah, of course, go. Great. So the question is, uh, one candidate is saying, I'm not sure on how to change my settings to open to opportunities. Okay, so we had just just looked at that. So basically, as you saw in that first. Sli the, the slide that I showed with the profile, if you go into your own profile, which you can do by clicking on your picture when you're sort of on your home page, you go in, but click on your picture, it's going to bring up your own profile and you're going to see how other people are viewing your profile. In there, right under your picture, there's a, a section that says, you know, click here if you're open to new opportunities and that's where you're going to go. And uh, somebody's Somebody is asking if it is acceptable to make LinkedIn posts related to projects from my personal blog. It's a good way to get attention. <laughs> Making purse, hold on. Is this, is this, I'm just trying to understand the question. To make LinkedIn posts related to projects from my personal blog, I was thinking of doing that to increase traffic to my blog. Absolutely. I think that's 100% fine. Um, you, the more, the stuff you want to avoid more on the personal side, when we talked about that earlier with LinkedIn is things like, you know, birthdays and talking about your wedding and the party you did last weekend and the barbecue you're having this weekend and recipes that you're sharing with people and things like that. That LinkedIn is not a place for that. If your blog is, it depends, I guess, actually my answer gonna, is going to be to this one, Jeffrey. If your blog is of a professional nature in the sense that it has something to do with your career, you're talking about development, you're talking about QA or whatever it is that you're talking about, then absolutely. If your blog is about 
recipes again, let's use an example, and cooking and barbecuing, then no, it wouldn't be an appropriate place to increase traffic to your blog. So it really depends what you're blogging about. Yeah, if, you're, if your blog is about embedded software development, then absolutely. LinkedIn is a fantastic place to drive traffic to your blog. And you're likely, and you can possibly even, I would even just one step further on that, look at finding groups that are related to embedded software development and sharing your blog with them as well. If there's no other questions, we'll move on. We have one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's about in-mails. Uh, many, they are saying, if I answer in-mails from recruiters, does that mean that I appear in the more likely to respond filter? Exactly. So the more that you respond to in-mails, the more recruiters you're associated to, but specifically to answer this question, the more in-mails you respond to, the more you will show up in that more likely to respond. So that, that being said, if somebody contacts you about a position that you're not interested in or that's in the different, a different city or just a completely different field, it's still worth just taking a quick second to write back to them, you know, thanks, but I'm not interested in this opportunity. And then, and then you move on from there. All right. That's all, yeah. Oh, one other quick question. So the question is, do you think it's okay to directly contact hiring managers for companies that you would like to work with? That is a difficult question to answer. <laughs> so generally speaking, no, you don't want to reach out to hiring managers directly, but it depends what, just because you don't want to bother them and, and then you become a pest and you become something that they have to deal with as opposed to an asset. So I think it really depends on how you're reaching out to them. If it's sending a quick message on LinkedIn because you saw that they have a job posting and you're figuring it's for their team and you'd love to apply, so you send your CV, then a quick message to them saying, hey, I sent in my CV, really hoping we get a chance to connect and talk about this, then that's acceptable. If it's just spamming hiring managers at a bunch of different companies you're interested in working for and saying, you know, I'm looking for a job, then I would really do that more to recruiters. That's what they're there for. Um, and they know about most of the jobs that are on the market anyways, I wouldn't do it directly to a hiring manager. You don't want to be, exactly, you don't want to be seen as a pest. You don't want to be seen as somebody that they like kind of have to get rid of because then when your CV does come through for an available job, they're going to recognize your name and go, oh no, this guy, you know, this girl just bothers me all the time. So I think you have to be really careful if you're contacting hiring managers directly. And I think secondly also that you never get to know who is the hiring manager anyways. You're just guessing and spamming their inbox. Yeah. So it's better to contact the HR department. That's what they're for. There. Yeah. And if you really do know a, a specific job, a specific application, a specific hiring manager, then a quick message saying I'm applying, I think that's fine, but I wouldn't go beyond that. I wouldn't then follow up a week later and say, hey, did you get my CV? Hey, did you really don't want to become somebody that's a bother to them. All right, so now we're going to take a look at two profiles from the same individual. I would like to point out that this individual has been fabricated by us. This is not a real person. The first version of this profile that we're going to look at is a rather unsuccessful profile. So I'd love to hear from you guys before we really go into the corrections of it. What the, and this is only page one of two, so there is some more, you know, there is another page following this. But I'll pause for the first half of this profile and tell me what you think. Yes, absolutely, Rajashi. The profile picture is not professional. That's the first thing that, that catches my eye as well. Those, what else are you guys seeing that needs to be changed? A spelling mistake. Spelling mistake. Yep. He spelled engineer wrong. He spelled it right here. <laughs> he just got it wrong here. <laughs> yeah. SW instead of software. That's a good point, Rihanna, because if somebody's searching for software developers, software engineers, he's not going to come up in their search. Absolutely. I would also add that here in his experience, there's zero description about what he's done at these jobs. We just know that he worked here and what the dates are, but we don't have any description. 
Let's take a look at the second page before we look at how this person can make their profile a lot better. So this is their second sort of scrolling down, if you will. There's education. There's some skills. Just so you know, if you show more here, there is no more. Um, so that's not really an option here. So we can see that it's a very bare bones. There's no endorsements on his skills. Exactly. There's no recommendations. And there aren't really very many skills listed either. Language. Not There's no languages mentioned. Good point. Absolutely. So it's a really very, very bare bones profile. And this is not the type of profile that is going to get a lot of traction on LinkedIn. And we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. We kind of have some, we've got some data to share. So if we look at a better way of improving this, and this is the type of profile everybody should be aiming for. So this is page one, and this is going to go through a few different, you know, we'll have to scroll down a couple times because there's really much more information. So here we've got a much more professional picture, a very specific job, uh, job title, mentioning that they're available for new mandate, a great about section here. So we can really see that he's added a lot of information about what he's done before, what he might be interested in for a future opportunity. As we scroll down here, we can see he's added lots of really great details about his previous positions, what he's done, what technologies he used specifically in those positions and in what way, which, which languages, whatever it is, that he, the information that he's included. As we keep going, he's added even more to this particular position. There's a bit more description as well about his education. It was decent in the other one, but now we really have exactly what his specialization has been. Moving further through, through his profile, we can see that he detailed two certifications about what he achieved, as well as his language skills in three different languages, which is really, really important, especially if you're located in Canada, particularly in Quebec, where people might be looking for English speakers, French speakers, or even third language. You know, he, this person in particular is a Swedish native. Um, there's positions and we get them regularly where those, are, those skills are, are looked for specifically. Lastly, here we see a very vastly improved skills and endorsement section. So he's really added all the skills and knowledge sets that he has. And this is going to be particularly useful when recruiters are searching through the platform and using specific keywords that the hiring manager is looking for. Now you see take skill quiz at the top. If you are in a more technical field, LinkedIn has recently added uh, quizzes for each sort of skill. So you can take a quiz on Java, you can take it on C, on Python, on JavaScript, on whatever it is. And then it would come up. Obviously, we haven't been able to do this because we didn't take any of the tests. That's why we don't see it. But then it would come up in brackets, the score that you received out of five on that particular thing. Now, you may wonder if making all these changes is really necessary. And we really strongly believe that it is. And we, like I mentioned, we have some evidence to back it up. So really interestingly, Josh created both of these profiles about a month ago. Since then, the quote unquote bad profile, the first one we looked at, has received zero in-mails, zero activity, no traction at all. However, for this particular profile we just looked at, he's received 17 in-mails from recruiters for that profile and 13 connection requests from recruiters. And that is, just so you know as well, a profile that is not really active. It's just up there. We're not posting anything. We're not commenting in the groups that he's joined. We're not commenting on other people in our thread that we're seeing. That is just from a purely passive account, but detailed account. We've already had 30 different communications, either through in-mails or connection requests, versus zero from the other. So like to me, that is just, it just shows how important that is because out of those 17 in-mails, who knows, maybe one of those would have been the perfect job for, this, you know, our, our friend Mark here. <laughs> that was just in one month. Kim. Yeah. And just in what, exactly, just in one month. So it really, really goes now, to show that it, go, sorry. Sorry, I'm saying now I'm in trouble because I have to respond to that in-mails. Yeah. <laughs> you need to respond and say, I'm sorry, this isn't a real person. Yeah. Um, another statistic to consider um, is one from within our own organization. We looked at how many placements we made during a three month period of last year when it was a little busier than it is right now to see where our candidates were coming from. 
And as you can see in this graph, a combined total of almost 90% of our placements came from LinkedIn, which is the blue and orange sections of this pie chart. If we look at the breakdown, we can see specifically 2% of placements came from both Indeed and Monster respectively. About 4% came from job boom and then referrals from existing candidates, respectively 4% each. 36% of our placements came from people applying to a posting on LinkedIn. And a staggering 52% came from searches that our recruiters did through their LinkedIn recruiter accounts. So I think both of these things, what we just talked about with Mark, and then seeing these statistics, it really shows you the importance of having a really well-written, detailed, and interesting LinkedIn profile. So, so far today, we learned about online sites to search for jobs, the importance of networking and improving your online presence, as well as how to upgrade your LinkedIn profile and the importance of upgrading that profile in order to stand out in the crowd. And as we summarize what we learned today, I'd really like to know what your biggest takeaways have been and if you have any questions about anything that we talked about today. Please take your time. I know it's a lot to take in. Yeah. And if anybody does want to have a, a video copy of this afterwards, we are recording this. So if you'd like to have a video particularly to go in more detail and really look at the profile that we looked at or anything, we're happy to send you uh, the link. It's a link that we send that's been active for a few days. So we're happy to send that to you after. Just shoot us an email so that we know that you'd like to get that link. So Jeffrey's saying you're really interested in approving your network. Absolutely. And participating or contributing to posts on LinkedIn. Definitely, really, really important. Everything that you can do to make yourself appear as an expert in your field is really going to make a difference, especially when you know, they get your CV and then a hiring manager is considering looking, you know, considering bringing you for an interview or they're about to bring you in for an interview. They're gonna go online, they're gonna look at you, they're gonna see, oh look, he's posting, he's commenting on all these things and posting on all these sites wow, this person is really passionate and engaged about what they do. So we did, we talked about meetup.com earlier. Um, that's a great site and there are others similar to that that I'm sure you can find through Google, but meetup.com is a great one and it's, they've, all, they've moved clearly to a virtual platform right now. It used to be in person, depending on your location. But that is really neat because there's different meetup groups really and really varied. So it can be specific to embedded software development for somebody like Jeffrey who's interested in that, but it can be, like I was saying before, there's meetup groups about fishing, there's meetup groups about building Legos, there's meetup groups about, there's, there's meetup groups about so many different types of topics. And, and not only are you going to be able to do stuff that you're passionate about and talk to other people who are passionate about it, but you just never know who you're talking to and if that person can help you find your next position. Absolutely, Edward, having a pro professional photo is really important. There's a lot that we see that are, you know, selfies that the person took or pictures of them clearly at a wedding wearing a tux with a boutonniere. Probably not the best idea for LinkedIn. Um, networking suggestions that are specific to programming. I think we talked about some of the sites before, like the Stack Overflows and stuff like that. I think those are really great sites. There is some stuff that we'll be sending you after. There's a link of different, uh, a page of like different webinars and trainings and places you can go um, and sites. And we can see if we can add any other suggestions on that specific to, to programming, Jeffrey. We also discussed, somebody saying, we also discussed about LinkedIn profile that how we need to be more descriptive, not just yes. one liner or one word. Yeah. Yeah, the description of your different jobs is often going to be really similar to your CV. It's going to be quite, you know, you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you've got a really robust, solid CV, then as you're creating your jobs in LinkedIn, you just copy and paste all the descriptions. It's important to have it in there. And especially as people are using keywords to search for you, the more times those keywords pop up in your profile, the higher up you're going to show up in the search results. 
because on a search like we looked at before with 806 results, like the, that would take a recruiter the entire day to go through. So realistically, they're going to go through the first few pages and then probably get busy doing something else, get called off, have an interview scheduled, whatever it is. So you wanna make sure you're showing up as early as possible in those results. Yeah, Jeffrey, I think looking for opportunities is really important. Um, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't even say that it's necessarily advertising that you're unemployed because lots of people have looking for opportunities, but they are working right now. They only make it specific to recruiters that can see that. If you're doing it at large, I mean, most people, you would be unemployed because they don't want their current employer who they're potentially connected with to see that they're looking for opportunities. But to specifically in today's job market, when so many people have lost their job because of COVID-19, and there's just such a high unemployment rate, there's no shame, there's no harm. If anything, it's a good thing to just let people know you're looking. Because if you don't pe let people know you're looking, they're not psychic, they're not gonna know. So I think that's a really, I don't think there's any shame in that right now or, th or that there should ever be, but particularly right now. Okay, I was thinking at one point since uh, we are actively looking for work, I think it's very important to reach out to our past managers or Absolutely. people uh, we want to use them as a reference because if you get a job interview you might leave, you might get a job and then they need your references so mm -hmm. be be prepared on that side too that's a really good point to be prepared with those references that you've spoken to them recently and when you are and this isn't the focus of this particular webinar we'll talk about it more next time but when you are asking people for references just because we brought it up it's a good idea to ask them if they're going to be giving you a positive reference. That's definitely a question that you can ask. Um, because shockingly, sometimes people give names and contact information of people and then the reference is not very good. So you really want to be making sure that whoever you're reaching out to for references is going to speak highly of you. Oh, fantastic, Jeffrey, for that recent manager writing. I apologize. I have a child who is screaming in the background. I don't know if you can hear her. Maybe you would like to put your headset on. Yeah, uh, I can hear. She's being brought into a different area of the house. I apologize for that, guys. Um, yeah, and, and like Aman is saying, don't be afraid to ask for an endorsement. So as Jeffrey mentions, he's got a great recommendation letter from a past employer. You could ask them to then put that in LinkedIn. If they wouldn't mind just taking a section of that, you can even sort of word it for them so that all they have to do is copy and paste it. And then they could write a recommendation for you on LinkedIn, which is a really, which is a really great way too. It helps people see what kind of person you are. And I, like the point of, and I like the point of yours, which you mentioned that speak to your referrals because uh, many times they might have changed their phone numbers or email addresses. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to give any false information to our future employers. Absolutely. And like Aman is saying too, there's no harm in giving endorsements in order to receive them. So there's no problem, you know, you can, I could write a nice endorsement about Josh and he writes one back to me and that's one more recommendation I have on my LinkedIn profile. So with past colleagues, past managers, that's a great thing to exchange as well. If you had a great relationship with your manager, I'm sure they'd love to have a recommendation on there from an employee who was really happy to work under them. And then they can, you know, sort of give you the, like do it in exchange for you. And then they'll write you a recommendation. Apologize, slightly distracted by the screaming child. She's gone now. Sorry about that guys. So I think that's all the, the comments that people have had. So I'd really like to thank everyone for attending the webinar today. As I mentioned a couple times, we'll be sending you some documents by email. You should be getting them within the next couple days. Um, and this includes a list of job posting websites, as well as a document that includes some free webinars, online classes that might be interesting for you during this time, particularly if you're at home and unemployed. So next week at the same time, we'll be giving our third and final webinar in this series. The next webinar really focuses on interview and how to ace your interview, so different strategies that can help you with any upcoming interviews you have. So we'd love it if you guys can join us for that as well. And then a little later this afternoon, you'll be receiving an email from me with a really short survey that I would so appreciate if you can fill out. It helps us learn 
both about what was successful about this webinar and also the different areas that we can improve on. It's really short. It's only like, I think, six or seven questions. It takes about two or three minutes to complete. So if you have time to do that, I'd really appreciate it. So if there's no other questions, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Have a wonderful day. You're welcome. It, it was our pleasure and uh, wishing you all a beautiful, wonderful Thursday afternoon. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, everybody.